It's my pleasure and my honor to introduce Dr. Linda Gilkerson, who I will say the first thing was a good friend of Patricia's, which makes it that much more exciting that you're here today for us. Dr. Gilkerson is an internationally recognized expert in infant mental health and early intervention. She is a professor and director of the Irving B. Harris Infant Studies Program at Erickson Institute, which is a graduate school in child development based in Chicago, Illinois. Linda, I'm gonna hand things over to you and thank you so much for coming. Oh my goodness. It is it's 7 a.m. by the way, the seven yeah. in the morning <laughs> at Linda's right now in Chicago. It's, yeah, the sun hasn't completely come up yet, but it, it will. Um, and um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. I know um, Paula and I realize we have many friends actually back in Chicago and it already feels like a community. I have friends here from the Harris Professional Development Network. So I, I just really am uh, honored to be here and especially to honor uh, Patricia. Uh, Patricia was a wonderful friend and a very important person in my life's work and that's the Fussy Baby program and also the FAN, which I'll tell you about. And I knew Patricia through the Harris Professional Development Network and Corey and Nareet, Miriam, others of you who are uh, Marsha, uh, had that same community to share in. Um, and I sought her out to help me think through this FAN that I'll share with you and find the right words for it. And also to spend six months with her on a sabbatical in San Francisco. So we'd planned the sabbatical. I had my date to arrive and my, my husband and I had packed up the car for our road trip across the country. And I get an email from Patricia that morning it, it, that we were leaving. It, it's the, the headline and it says, I suck. And I'm not sure exactly how that translates, but basically she was writing to tell me that she wasn't going to be there. She'd forgotten she was out of town. And could I delay my trip for another week? And I thought to myself, Patricia was a role model for me in so many ways in my life. And that was another one. If you've messed up, just say so. Um, you know, there was a complete honesty from her, uh, complete empathy for others. Um, she was so accepting um, and so clear too about calling out injustice when she saw it. And it's really appropriate that this, this symposium is on the day here in the United States when we honor Martin Luther King, um, as she also sought social justice in every part of her life. Um, so again, she took real joy actually in coming to our Fussy Baby meetings. We gathered twice a year, folks around the country who are working on this. And I worried, you know, how she could spare the time to come and be with us. And she said, she said, Linda, she said, it's good to be away from trauma for a while. Um, so I want to share that with you as a gift from her. It's good to be away from trauma for a while. It's good to find balance and to give yourself permission to do that as she savored being with us at our Fussy Baby meetings. She knew about Fussy Babies because there'd been a Fussy Baby in her family and niece or nephew. So she felt in her heart how important this work was. Um, and she thought this fan that I'm going to share with you was so valuable. She said to me at one point, I wish I'd thought of it myself. And I think what she was saying too, is what I'm going to share with you is not new. You know all that I'll be sharing with you. But there's a way in which we've been able to package it, I think, that helps you teach others what this complex part of relationship building is all about. Um, so... I took such pleasure in preparing for it today. It was almost like my saying to, to Patricia, look what's come of all of this. Um, so here we go. I want to share it with you. And I really picture her glowing um, with me and with you <clears throat> as we share. <clears throat> now comes a moment, I hold my breath, share the screen and put the PowerPoint up. Um, So here we go. It works. Okay. Yay, it works. And I also want to acknowledge our award winners um, for the incredible work that you are doing and Paula for the leadership that she's shown in Israel around CPP. Um, so this work I'm going to share with you started with Fussy Babies and their parents. And I had a chance to develop the first clinical program at Erickson. And I wanted to do something, this was in 2003, that related to infant and early childhood mental health. 
and I knew that the work with fussy, I'd been a fussy baby. You know how many others of you have been, and I'd had a fussy baby. So I kind of knew this from the inside out, uh, but I also knew it as a person, as a in my personal life, but I knew as a professional that it held that essence of infant mental health, thinking about the baby, thinking about the parents, thinking about their relationship, and then thinking about the relationship they would have with the people that would support them. Um, so before we started this program, we talked with parents, and what did they tell us? Um, they told us that they were emotionally and physically exhausted, um, that they were isolated because of criticism. They would pulled back, whether it was in the grocery store or from their, their own mother or their family. Everyone knew what they should do, and it wasn't what they were doing. Um, and they were continually searching for either the cause or a cure. And most poignantly, they had lost confidence in themselves and lost confidence in their baby. Um, and what they told us stayed with us as we developed this whole program. They said, anyone who listened helped. That became our task, how to listen to the story. Um, and many of you've heard of, probably have seen this crying curve. It looks so simple, doesn't it? Babies don't cry very much in the beginning and it peaks about six weeks and then it goes down and there you are. But here is the inside story. That's what that smooth curve really looks like. All those babies with different patterns, different ways of being. Um, the question is, who is this baby? And the most important part, who is this baby to this parent? Um, we had parents fill out cry diaries and we asked this very big question. Um, and that was, if your baby's cry is your baby's crying a worry or concern for you? And the answer to that was really determinative of the outcome. Um, it wasn't this where their baby was on the crying curve, but it was this. And if the answer was yes to that, they were at higher risk for depression, they were at higher risk for anxiety, and they had much higher risk for, being, for losing confidence in themselves. And we repeated that study with fathers as well as mothers. So we knew now that it was about internal experience. Who is this baby to me? How is this crying affecting me? How can I parent this baby? Um, I'll tell you about the first two families that taught us this lesson once again. Uh, the first was a family physician. Here he is, a uh, representation of him. You can imagine how many families a family physician has helped through this crying curve period, hundreds and hundreds. But they weren't baby Grace. He had his first baby and that baby was so sensitive and could not be soothed and could not be soothed by him. And he'd heard about our program just beginning and he called up to ask for sleep tips, sleep tips. Here is a doctor who's helped so many families through sleep. But what he really needed to say was something that he could barely speak. Um, and that was that he didn't love this baby and he couldn't believe that he could feel that way. Um, he needed to have that held. He needed a soft landing. He needed someone to get it and to, to be there and hold that with him. And listening to him, listening to his quiet voice say those words, seeing the relief that came as he shared that uh, was what he all he needed at that point. And you could see him lighten up through this call. And at the end, he was laughing and he said, well, at least my wife likes her. And uh, he had shifted, having had his feelings held. So that was our first family. But was that what our second family needed? No. This was a teen parent. And she'd been to every emergency room in her community saying, there's something wrong with my baby. And the baby had checked out head to toe. And each doctor had told her, nope. Nothing's wrong with your baby. Nothing's wrong with your baby. And what was she left to feel? There must be something wrong with her. But she insisted that there was something that needed to be seen and heard. She didn't need our empathic support. She needed our respect. And she needed us to think with her. She needed us to point to those jittery legs and say, is that part of what you're working, you're worried about? I see it too. And here's what I'm thinking it might mean, uh, needing something very different. So how do you know how to use yourself 
in these different ways became our question. Um, and what is it that might be in common that these parents need? Um, so we learned that we had to stay a lot longer in the hard places that we had a mother of a four week old call us and say that her baby had autism. Four weeks, brand new. We knew she'd tried to tell that to many other people too. And what had she heard? Oh no, don't worry, relax. You know, can't that, that's not anything you could know now. Um, let me help you. Um, but it hadn't changed her worry a bit. Um, we, she needed someone to say to her, wow, how hard it must be to be so concerned so soon. You know, what is it that you're seeing that might make you feel your baby has autism? We needed to go there with her. We learned that parents can't shift how they see their babies, their children, until we can see first through their eyes and understand their reality. We also realized that we had to help parents find their own way, that they are the soothers, they are the problem solvers, they're the pilots, we're a co-pilot. Um, and how Eric Erickson says, you have, to you have to parent with somatic conviction. You have to believe in your body that what you're doing is right for your baby. And how do you stay close enough to that parent's experience to get to something they actually can do and do over and over again? The solution was going to come from within. Um, and how can we engage in a way to find it is our question. And then we knew we needed to have a model that could hold us as the caregiver. It's hard to hear a parent say their baby's evil. Um, I had a mom who I knew well tell me her baby was an alien to her. And oh my goodness, you can imagine what started in my mind. My diagnostic classifications, worries about the relationship. But I could take that deep breath, which we'll talk more about, go to this mindful self-regulation place, kind of clear the slate and say, tell me more about that. And she said, we've never had a red haired baby in our family before. I don't know where she came from. And she started to chuckle. It was a whole different story than I was creating in my mind. You know, so how to hold ourselves, how to contain ourselves, so we can hold others um, as well. So our theory of change really became that of attunement. And this really expressed in this phrase that when someone feels truly understood or known, seen, uh, that creates the opening, that creates the space where it's possible for them to take in new ways of interacting, new ways of seeing, be able to really engage with us um, as helpers. Seeing, being no, understood and connected seem to be the key. Daniel Stern has a wonderful quote about being with, and that is to share in another's experience with no attempt to change what that person is doing or believing in that moment. Not trying to change that mother's view that her baby had autism in that moment, but to truly hear it. Um, that this is what is going to help open the space again for change. That's hard to do. We're trained often to fix and our urge is to step in so quickly and teach and inform. But how to be with became the, the secret sauce, as we say. Um, Bruce Perry has said that healing comes through repeated, we would say attuned interactions with a compassionate, regulated other. That's our gift, being that compassionate, regulated other over and over and over in those moments um, that create the relationship. So how do you do that? What can help? So this is the fan. Um, and as again, as I mentioned to you, as I share, it's not going to be new to you, but hopefully it's a way to hold on to what you know and a way to teach what you already know to others about relationship building. Um, so in the center of the fan is the parent's concern, that other person's concern. Uh, it could be my husband's concern as the plumbing, as our plumbing 
we have a big leak in the kitchen right now and a plumber's coming today. <laughs> and that was very big on his mind last night. And that needed my full attention for him. Um, what is that concern that someone's presenting you with? Um, and then around that concern in the fan, there are five wedges. Um, and the one on the left, my left, is our wedge. It's called calming or mindful self-regulation. That's where we go and we try and maintain that, that responsive, reflective presence, that, that infant mental health stance, I think that we've all learned. But there are things that throw you off, right? The things that dysregulate you. And that's where you go on the fan, mindful self-regulation. So you can catch yourself in those very moments in that interaction. Acknowledge what's happening for you, accept it, and be able to regulate and reset yourself so you can think clearly, what is happening here? What is really needed? And how can I use myself most effectively for that other person? And then we have these other four wedges. The first one is a feeling wedge. If someone's in feelings, we can meet them there. Um, and we'll talk more about the simple ways that we do that and the ways we've kind of named how to do that. Um, if someone is um, in, if, if feelings are more contained and they want to problem solve with you, then you go to collaborative expression or thinking with them. If you're in our doing like a cry diary with a parent, if we're kind of thinking along, they're trying to report when their baby slept and when their baby uh, cried, et cetera, and you're kind of flowing along, but all of a sudden they kind of pull back, they glaze over, they get confused, they can't remember what's happening. They're no longer in thinking, are they? They've shifted probably back to feelings. So we learn to shift with families and use this as a guide. Um, then there's a doing wedge. That's when people are ready to learn something or to try something new. And a lot of times we run to that. One of my colleagues said, I go from the door to doing. I've got my stuff, I need to teach it, I need to, <laughs> I need to download in a way, uh, you know, what I have to offer. So it works best with an invitation that someone's ready. When that's there, what we have to offer is priceless. How do we read the cues to know what someone's ready to receive? It's our question. And then the last wedge is the reflecting wedge. And that's really watching for insights that parents have. Uh, reflective functioning, seeing something in a new way and holding on to that for them, helping parents build on that. I had a mom tell me in a fussy baby visit, she said, um, I get it. You know, she said, my baby doesn't like to be touched and I don't either. All of a sudden she saw it all in a new way. Oh, wow, how, what an insight, you know, in staying there with her, helping her hold that, build on that. Um, that's the reflecting wedge. Um, Merib is déjà un petit peu. Let's see. Paula, any, how am I doing? Am I going too fast, too slow? You're doing fine. Feedback? Seems fine, okay. I think, yeah. If okay, anybody has good. anything else to say, you're welcome to say it in the chat, but so far we're all listening. Okay, great. So what does attunement require? It requires reading that other person's cues, kind of figuring out where they are, responding flexibly based on what they're showing you, um, and respecting how much they can take in and going at their pace, um, and recognize and regulating ourselves. So again, we can see clearly and respond flexibly. Um, it's like simply put, being on the same page with another person. Jenny Cole Mossman is a fan trainer and a CPP trainer. And she said, it's not about getting them to where I want them to be. It's getting me where they are, you know, and then going from there. Um, so in the fan is this interactive process in the interaction. But we also offer a structure we call the arc of engagement, which is helpful in organizing sessions, um, contacts, and also supervision. Um, so it starts with you and it ends with you. So we call this the pre-contact routine. 
how am I before I turn on that Zoom, before I you know link up to that Zoom call, um, how am I before I begin an assessment? Um, what do I need to be fully present to this family? And in our training, we help people identify their pre-contact routines. We have a wonderful home visitor who, as she pulls up to a family's home um, in the old days, soon to come back, um, she would stop the car, turn it off, and literally take a deep breath. And then she would get out of the car and she would mindfully walk to the door mindfully meaning watching each foot fall and thinking only of her steps. And then she got to the doorstep. She planted one foot, then the other, grounded herself for a moment, took another breath, and she always knocked in the same way. She had two knocks followed by two more. And she said to herself, I'm here to listen. And that's how she began her home visits. And she had five or six home visits a day. And each visit began that way, uh, a way to prepare herself. We, we train physicians in this model. And one of the physicians said to me, if I didn't reset myself before each, each room, he said, I'd still be thinking about what I missed in the pad in, with a patient I just saw. This way, every patient is a new patient to me. So starting with ourself. And it can just be a moment. It can just be, you know, an intentional breath. So then somewhere we learned in the beginning of our contacts to use these precious words for you. And in our home visiting work and other work, we wanted to shift the focus to parenting early on. So we asked this question, what's it been like for you? And we would finish it in different ways to take care of your baby since I saw you last or since you brought your baby home, you know, or since you had that assessment. For you are the key words here to start with that internal experience. Um, and then somewhere in the middle of our contact, we want to slow down for ourselves and those we're with and just pause and check in. Hey, how are we doing? I just want to check in for a minute. Are we getting to what was most on your mind today? It's a way to share power, a way to let the client lead, and a way to understand, you know, the attunement at that point. Um, most of the time, parents say, fine. Sometimes they say, you know, I got to take my pre I got to take my other child to the doctor this afternoon. I can't I can't stop thinking about it. So you you may have a redirection there. And then we also learn not to rush off at the end, as tempting as it can be, but to try and slow the end down a bit. Um, and ask parent give parents time to reflect on their child and time to reflect on the experience that you've had together. And we'll often ask if you could describe your child. Today, in three words or a word, what would you say? And then we just hear where they are. Someone said it's a window into where the parent is. Um, and another parent said to us, if you hadn't asked me that, I wouldn't be thinking, you know, I wouldn't have thought um, to say, I wouldn't have thought how to describe my child. Um, and then we also ask this last question. We say, I've, we've talked about a lot of important things I'm wondering if there was something you'd like to remember from our time together that would be helpful to you. Um, in supervision, we use the same arc and we also might say, I'm wondering if there's something you'd like me to remember from our time together and hold for our relationship. Um, again, a chance to reflect, but it's not over. Then comes that after the contact moment, that checking back in with yourself. How am I now? And what do I need to do to be present for what comes next? These busy days we have, how to have a marker, a space, again, to process what we need to contain and be able to move forward. Um, so the fan is the interactive process and the arc is the structure around it. So I'm gonna walk you through this. And this comes from a home visit um, and this is a, a home visit in a program, Healthy Families America program, um, which, ser which serves higher risk families. And so this was a home visitor who knew the family was pretty well. This baby was nine months old. She goes to visit that day and she hears a big commotion behind the door. She opens the door and mom's there and she says this to her home visitor, 
my baby has ADHD. And her boyfriend is there and he says, no, you're the one with the problem. You're the one with ADHD. And her sister's there too and says, you're stay off the internet. You're killing us. You know, everybody is what? Upset, right? Everyone is in feelings. Um, so Jerry Paul teaches us that it's just not possible to work on behalf of other people and to help them without having powerful feelings aroused in yourself as well. So where was our home visitor? We think about the fan framework. Um, she was thinking, oh no, she was feeling panic, not going in there. You know, she's in a moment of shock herself, but there's a place for her on the fan. And she's just learned this model. And so she knows about a little bit about mindful self-regulation and that's where she goes. Um, mindful self-regulation we've learned are four strategies that people use the most in these moments. One is breathing. One intentional breath can help reset the autonomic system. There are many different ways people use their breath to help them regulate. Grounding is another strategy that people use. It could be just uncrossing your legs and planting your feet both on the ground when you're in a, in a session and just being able, feeling your sit bones on the chair, shoulders back, deep breath, and you're ready to go. Or it can be self-talk, which many people use. One of our, this is again from a physician's example who said, I want to flee when they get upset. So we, we have people write their mindful self-regulation strategies on the back of their, their name tags that they wear, put little stickers on it. And so this physician's word was stay. In other words, I don't have to flee, I can stay. Um, some people will say, you know, just keep listening. I have a wonderful colleague who said, just keep listening, more will be revealed. And that was what she would say to herself at these moments. Imagery also can help. Another colleague, um, evoke the image of being in a warm wheat field. The sun is there, you're opening up, you're becoming, she uses this image when she becomes critical and pointed and narrow. And when she feels that warmth of the sun, has the image of the wheat field, you know, flowing, she becomes more open and more flexible and more present. So this home visitor went to breathing and she took what she called her deep breath pause. And mindful self-regulation is there not to just to be calm, but to help you think what is needed here more clear. And she said, I saw the fan rising in my head. She was just learning this model. And she thought, what is happening for this mom? Yes, of course, this mom is in feelings. Um, she'd walked in now, the mother had actually turned away from her and walked across the room. The boyfriend, their sister had left, they left the room. And there she was with this very upset mom. What can she do? This was a home visitor who said she isn't a feelings person, but she had learned that she could be present. So what are some simple ways that people support uh, families when they're in feelings? Um, you can hold feelings. You can validate feelings. You can explore feelings. And all of this feeling world is helped by what we call the power of pause. There's a Native American saying called be lean of speech. Use simple language and then pause. Um, holding feelings means just leaning in, if you will. Um, it's usually nonverbal. It's really shown on your face and your tone of voice. And basically you're saying, I'm here. Um, you know, it's letting this story be told. It's listening with acceptance. It might be putting your hand on your heart if something particularly touching is said, um, but it's really showing your compassionate presence. Often that's enough uh, for people um, to begin to open up. Uh, you can validate by acknowledging another's felt reality. And all of this, again, you know, and you can explore, which is just inviting to share more. Well, this home visitor decided to validate the mother's feelings. Mother's across the room now and she says, must be so hard to be so worried about your baby. Um, and the mother turned around and looked at her and walked across the room back by her and sat down 
and said to her, he's driving me crazy. And now they're connected. Um, so is this a mom that's going to talk a lot more about her feelings and need a lot more support there? And you'd say, or is this a mom who's got something else on her mind? Well, this was a mom who wanted to just say that, you know, but she then she started talking about her child's behavior. It wasn't so much the affect that was there, but she wanted to, to, to think about her child. So there's another way of being in feelings, and that we call as bridging. And this is when you've acknowledged the feelings and you're going to see if it's, if it's possible to move on. So you've kind of got one foot in the feeling wedge. I hear how concerned you are. Then one foot in this one, in the thinking wedge. And this home visitor was supposed to do an ASQ, a developmental screening that day. And so she said to the mom, I hear how concerned you are. I wonder if you'd like to think about him together. You know, would you be open to doing the ASQ today? And the mom said, yes, she would. So they moved into thinking together. We put assessments in the thinking wedge, not in the doing wedge, because it's where you meet it with openness and curiosity. Um, so there they are in the thinking wedge, um, flowing along, asking questions, mom responding. And all of a sudden, yeah, the, the thinking wedge requires that belief in the parent. It's this slow down space. Um, of the pause before doing, it's thinking together without pressure for things to have to be a certain way. It's giving up control in those moments when we're really exploring with a parent. We found in our research that the more that home visitors endorse a collaborative exploration, the more likely they are to say that they're less, that there's less burnout. There's something about expanding that space where you're exploring and not knowing it yourself that reduces the pressure, but yet opens uh, for the parent. So, um, so she finds herself as she's going through the ASQ, feeling, starting to have feelings, feeling kind of urgent, kind of stirred up for herself. And she's saying to herself, don't you see this? I'm proven to you, your baby's okay. Your baby doesn't have ADHD. So what's happening here is our home visitor is getting activated again. She's identifying with that baby. She's getting frustrated with the parent, but she recognizes it and she knows to go back to mindful self-regulation. And this time she uses self-talk and she says to herself, slow down, Tiffany, slow down, slow down. Just keep listening. Mom's got to see this herself. Slow down. And so she resets herself in the interaction and there they are back again to collaborative expiration, thinking along with the parent. But the parent now shifts the interaction, interestingly. And the parent says to her, have you ever heard of a nine month old walking? So seeking information is in the doing wedge. The doing wedge is when you want to learn something or try something new. So this mom has moved them there, asking a question. So in the doing wedge, as we said, it works best when there's an invitation. It works best when the parent's ready to learn something. It works best when they can focus on the, on the child and focus on you. So what do we do in those doing moments? We highlight strengths that parents have already. We offer information in this particular way. We call it drop and explore. You have about 20 seconds. When somebody asks you something to really, that window opens up. We had a wonderful example in a, in a visit with a dad. Uh, he wasn't paying too much attention the whole time he was texting, but he heard this word temperament. And he looked up and he said, what's temperament? I've never heard of that. Well, we could write a book on that, right? We have so much to say, but you have seconds with him. So what did the visitor say? She said, you know, Babies have personalities right from the start. That was the drop. And then the explore was, what have you noticed about your baby? He says, oh, she's nothing like her brothers. And we are off in a conversation. Um, so there are also capacity building moments, which I'll talk about at a later point. And then there are these angel moments 
when you spot the love looks, as we say, when the parent and the child really are connected with each other. And Patricia gave us the words, what do you do in those moments? You glow with them, she said, you glow with them. Um, but for this mom, what was needed was a drop and explore. So our home visitor says to the mom, many babies walk around their first birthday. Um, and then they explore. Have you heard of a baby walking at nine months? She says. And the mom says, no, I never have. And she begins to talk about her neighborhood and how unsafe it is. And how her brothers are starting to get in trouble and how worried she is this baby's going to be a wild child. If he's like this now, what's going to happen when he's older? So mom has shifted us now, hasn't she? The mom who didn't have a lot to say in the feeling wedge earlier now is flooded with feelings of worry and concern. So where's the home visitor at this moment? She also is flooded. And she's feeling overwhelmed and helpless and sad and somewhat guilty herself. She was of the same race as this mom, but she'd grown up in a privileged background. And she knew that she, she felt like, how can I help? What can I bring at this moment? Um, and she thought, I can't change the neighborhood. I can't fix what, what she's worried about. But using mindful self-regulation, this time again, was breathing and grounding herself as she thought through this. She really realized and used self-talk. She realized what she could do. And she said, I can't change her neighborhood, but I can tell her how much she cares. I know that about her. And so then she moved both of them to back to the doing wedge and acknowledging that strength that was within that mother. And she said, I know how much you care. I know how hard you're working to be a good mom. And there they were. Um, and mom could hear that. So now we're to the end of the visit, that arc I mentioned to you. And she asked the mom, if you could describe your baby in three words, what would you say? She says, he's all over the place. Uh, she says, and he's mine. So you can see a bit of a shift here. And when she asked what she'd like to remember, the mom said, he can do a lot of stuff. And she said that with some pride. So again, we hope, when we think about integration, we think about it this way. It's not that things, problems necessarily go away, but that you see them in a different light, or you see yourself in a different light in relationship to that issue. It's a, more of a sense of coherence, if you will, about the world, about who you are, and how you can help in it. And that's what we hope is the outcome. So this band thing has been described as a GPS. It's like trying to follow the path and rerouting, rerouting as needed. Um, observe, take your best guess where that person is, watch their response, ask yourself this profoundly deep clinical question, is it working? <laughs> you know, are we on the same page? And if you are, you know, you're there you are flowing along. If not, you can reattune. And I think you know this from Ed Tronic's work. Relationships are messy. Ed has a new book out called The Power of Discord. He talks about in all relationships, adult relationships, as well as parent-child relationships. You know, it's the messiness of it that is the sturdiness of it. It's not the, as we know, it's not the presence of mismatch, but it's the absence of repair. And he teaches us that mismatch is really the norm in many relationships, that this 30% of the time in his research, you get it right, we'll say the first time. The 70% is the trying to figure it out. No, that wasn't quite where they were. No, I went too fast. Or even thinking about it later and coming back the next day or, the, or in your next visit and saying, you know, I think I missed the boat when I was here last time. I got so excited about what you, that you wanted to go back to school. I almost signed you up myself, but I'm not sure that's where you really are with it. You know, could we talk about that again? So this beautiful process of match, mismatch and repair 
is what the fan helps us validate over and over again. And a wonderful quote from Dr. Brazelton, um, when you do something that doesn't work, you have the opportunity to learn something and grow closer. Um, so we think of repair as really a part of a professional competency. It's part of the sturdiness of relationships. It's a part of getting closer. Um, so Kohut has this interesting concept of a fragmented versus a vital self. And we've, the fan is used in so many different circumstances, which I'll talk about in a minute. I kept thinking, you know, what is it that makes this so translatable and so helpful? And I think that it, it relates to these three concepts that Coet talks about, about the vital self versus the fragmented self. The vital self has coherence and in in that the fan helps you name things, it helps you see what's happening. The fan gives continuity. It helps you track what's happening and knit those fragments together. This helps, helps in reflective processing. Oh, that's where you started. The parent didn't have many feelings, but then at the end they did, didn't they? And so you can see the bigger picture. Um, and it helps you be calm and it organizes you so you can be present to others. Um, so right now it's used in over 20 states in five countries, lots of work around physician training, we're partnering with Healthy Families America and Nurse Family Partnership to build this into their evidence-based models. Um, we train infant early childhood mental health systems in the United States to use the consultation fan as their framework because as a consultant in a childcare setting, you are pulled into the doing wedge right the minute you walk in that door, you know, but how can you build capacity? The fan helps hold those consultants in that more collaborative, explorative space. It helps operationalize the consultation stance. And it's used in Part C, early intervention, OTPT and speech. Um, we have a new partnership with Serena Weeder to bring the fan into DIR. And it's used in the court, system, court projects. Patricia would be so pleased about that. Uh, judges and lawyers are beginning to think differently. And it's also used in Israel. And I wanna pause here and invite my wonderful friend and colleague, Marsha, to share a little bit about mom to mom and about what the fan has given to your program. So I'd like to ask Marcia to unmute and share. Hi, Linda, it's great seeing you. Great to um, see you. Thank you for me to speak a little bit. Uh, and thank you to Haru who uh, every year um, lets us remember and uh, think about Patricia. Um, Linda asked me to talk a little bit about how we use um, the fan in our home visiting project, Mom to Mom, or M La M in Hebrew, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, for those of you who don't know about M La M, uh, it's just in two sentences. It's a 20 year old uh, home visiting project that offers emotional support to mothers after childbirth. Home visitors are um, women, mothers from the community, volunteers who want to help. Um, visits are once a week for up to a year and our services are provided free of charge. Um, we use the fan in lots of ways. It's been integrated in MLN since its inception. Um, I'd like to talk about three ways that we use the fan and some of this is going to um, overlap with what Linda said but it will give another example. First of all, the fan makes us listen. And listening is absolutely an essential component of home visits. Um, it allows the home visitor to get to know the mom or get to know the client and gets to know um, what's on her mind. At the same time, listening isn't that easy. And as Linda described, sometimes it can be overwhelming, it can be dysregulating, and um, it's the fan really provides um, um, a tool which from the get-go um, you are reminded that you are there to listen. I love that story of the home visitor who knocks and says, I am here to listen. listen. Um, the wedge of the empathic inquiry has always been my favorite. 
I remember many years ago, you said to me and, and to all of us who were learning the fan, no one can listen to you unless they are free of all of that emotion mm. that is in their brain and heart. Mm. Um, and so we just have to sit it out and wait quietly until the storm is over. Um, I have held true to that. Um, we teach that and for volunteers in a home visiting system, uh, home visiting project, it is really quite essential. Uh, so the fan makes us listen. Um, it also helps us navigate. And I love the screen of uh, the GPS or so ways mm -hmm. um, for paraprofessionals who walk into homes um, of mothers with young children, often with other children as well, because it can be quite um, arousing, quite overstimulating. And having the fan in hand um, to remind us what the steps are and how to get to, to the end or how to get backwards and how to get forward and not lose our way is really, really helpful. Um, it, helps the it helps the volunteer, the home visitor, keep their eye on the ball. And that really is essential because we would like the, the clients also to keep their eye on the ball. So listening and helping and navigating. And the third is uh, also very important to me at least, uh, the, the fan has always served as a secure base. I'm not sure mm -hmm. how much of it is the fan and how much Linda standing by. <laughs> but in any case, just uh, the representation of the mm -hmm. fan in my head um, and, and in, the, in the heads of the home visitors allow a certain calming. We have that tool, mm -hmm. we're not alone, even if we are alone in the home visit, we have something to hold on to and something to rely on. Mm -hmm. um, I want to add really quickly that uh, the FAN is really important for professionals who may not have the background or the skills or the practice uh, to be in homes where there's lots going on, but the FAN and it's really, really important for us professionals. We also need a GPS and we also need means um, of, of regulating and reminders to listen. I want to say finally that without any question, um, I am a better mother and grandmother as a, as, a, as, a, as a result of the fan. I support my children better. I listen better. Um, I feel better. And so for that, and for friendships of decades, and for being here, um, really thank you with all my heart. Oh, Marcia, thank you. You have been part of what's helped me sustain this work over time. To know its value in your program and its value to you um, has been so meaningful. Thank you. And it is a little bit like this internal supervisor, isn't it? It's this, this framework that you can carry with you so you're not alone in these moments right and i think it helps you talk about it to other people afterwards um you know when you have this shared language we see across programs um, when you can come back from a visit or, or a court you're in the court come back from a hearing and say you know you know everyone was in feel i was in mindful self-regulation the whole time someone knows exactly what you're talking about and you can go from go from there um, so let me share my screen again Um, yeah, so I want to just talk briefly about how it's a framework for trauma-informed practice and shift a little bit to how it's a complement to CPP or can be a support and then move towards a fan and relationship even to social justice. Um, so principles of trauma-informed practice really, I think, are illustrated in the fan by promoting safety through this predictable, consistent structure, the ARC families that are experiencing chaos, chaotic lives, and where they have to monitor everything, not sure what's gonna happen next. They know when you come, how it's going to go. Um, it takes this non-judgmental, respectful, empathic stance of attunement and doesn't push things over too fast, really respects where people are and values that. It allows practitioners to acknowledge our own responses and respond to them with acceptance. I'm scared, I'm afraid, I wanna run, um, and but have balancing strategies that can keep us present. Um, it doesn't avoid difficult topics. It helps us provide a way to acknowledge those feelings and experiences. That's that feelings wedge. 
And it helps people sort out what makes sense to them. and doesn't impose a solution too quickly, which is so important for families who have felt not necessarily respected by the system to be treated and held with respect and, and um, seeking solutions through them, with them is, uh, is healing in itself. And of course, it builds opportunities for reflective functioning, which is a protective factor. So Patricia and I spent time thinking together about the FAN in relationship to higher risk families. And she said, we've got to put that professional's urgent concern right in there too, because you're balancing both of them. And later on, we said, we really need to put the system's uh, concern in too, when you're working in child welfare, because you're also managing that. And she added something called an overwhelmed parent moment. We thought about this a lot. You know, where does that go on the fan when the parent can't regulate themselves anymore and they need you to step in? And we decided together, but really with her leadership, that it went in the doing wedge, not in the feeling wedge. Yes, it's about regulating feelings, but more importantly, it's building that parent's capacity so that they can regulate themselves, that they can learn through this experience with you. So we put overwhelmed parent moment in the doing wedge. And what is an overwhelmed parent moment? Again, we were developing this for home visitors. You've seen this a lot in your clinical work. It's for any family, it can be for any family experiencing high stress. It's when a parent's dysregulation is so present in the here and now that it becomes a priority. I heard about a mom who, um, um, th th she came to on a home visit and her kids had gotten in the pile of clean clothes and spilled bleach all over the clothes. And they were in the laundry room and she came in and she started screaming at her kids and throwing clothes at the kids. And you are there as a home visitor. What do you do? So you're not frozen in that moment. Um, or if you are frozen in that moment, you can acknowledge that for yourself and catch yourself and unfreeze. You know that that's your priority now. You know that this that um, that there's strong. This happens when there's strong reactions in the caregiving environment, like I just mentioned, or when someone maybe disassociates or spaces out. You're not sure what, that where they are. So what did what did we come up with? To acknowledge to ourselves that this parent is unable to manage their affect alone, and they need us to shift gears. We become a co-regulator now. We engage in a more active way. Um, but we do that, and Patricia was so clear about this, by maintaining an empathic tie to the part of the parent that wants to be there for their baby, to that mom who loved those four kids and wanted them to be safe, even though she was yelling at them and throwing clothes at them. There was a part of her that wanted to be, diff to be different. And to offer that experience of co-regulation in a way that can be internalized, that's not shaming, but that's helpful, that a parent can use when this happens again. So Patricia's guidance in overwhelmed moments was to ground yourself first, turn to yourself, consider safety, if need be in that moment for yourself and others, and to acknowledge the overwhelmed feelings you have that others have. Um, and then to help people be grounded and regulated, as I mentioned, to interrupt that cycle of arousal, whether it's low or high, to help that other person reestablish the connection between their body and their mind and reorient to the present, and then slowly help them reattune to the child. It's not going to be automatic, that last one. There's a process that needs to go through. And Paula, I'm glad to put all of this in a PDF and send it to you so we can share all these slides with everyone. Um, That's been the big, the big question in the chat. Is how yeah, are they going yeah, to yeah, get please. Class? Yes, and not to worry. I'm sorry I didn't say that earlier. Then, yeah, then you wouldn't have had to be thinking about that. Right. right. Thank you so um, much. Yeah. So again, these are some of her words. I'm very, wor I'm worried about you and your baby now. You seem so upset. How would it feel to put the baby down so we can talk a little more? Um, you seem so angry, but you told me you never want to hurt him. How can I help you now? Um, you look so frightened. May I take your baby for a moment? Something we would not rec do in other parts of our interaction, but that's what's attuned in that moment. Or if there's a couple fighting, you're both so angry right now that we can't think. 
could we just stop talking for a moment so we all can cool down? And then you may introduce your affect regulation technique. Maybe it's a glass of water. Maybe it's breathing together. Maybe it's standing up. Maybe it's taking a, a short break. And when it's safe again, focus on the process. What were you feeling that allowed things to get so out of hand? Uh, but again, a process of regulation, respecting that fan wedges uh, before you can think. Um, so she says we have to accept the parent's subjective reality without necessarily joining them as an objective reality. That's what we say. You can validate someone's experience, but you're not agreeing with it. You're not saying that's true. Um, you don't have to agree. You have to see from the other's point of view. She said to empathize with overwhelmed feelings, um, but juxtapose those angry feelings with the good care that the parent wants to offer and slow down these moments to increase their awareness of their own thoughts and feelings and responses. And when you hear something positive, slow down even more so the parent can begin to understand themselves as wanting to be protective of that baby. So I want to share a little bit now from my wonderful colleague, um, Jenny Cole Mossman and her colleague, Barbara Jess Jessing, about how the FAN and CPP can go hand in hand. I think both of these were loves of Patricia's. Um, and this is a very powerful story. They wrote it up in zero to three, and I'm just going to share a little bit of it with you. Um, so this happened in a courtroom in rural Nebraska. Um, where a child's future was on the line. And I'm reading now from their article in Zero to Three. Three-year-old David had lived with his foster and adoptive parents since he was six months old. His mother, it's not too clear what happened to him early on, but his mother was known to have a drug addiction. So he came into care because of severe neglect. He had poor eye contact, he didn't cry, even when he needed to be changed or fed. And when he had visits with his mother, he would be very dysregulated afterwards. And by the time he was two, he had very little contact with her. So when the biological mother, in a sense, became missing, the foster parents offered this best chance for permanency. The final hearing came that day. The parent rights were gonna be terminated. The foster mother said she'd finally worked through her hesitation and let go of the fear that the mother was going to come back. But what happens on that very day? She'd given her full heart to David. The child's biological father walks in the courtroom. He had only, and he'd had his paternity confirmed. He'd only had a one time encounter with the mother. He'd not known he'd had a child. And he made it known to the court that he wished to, inter that he wished to intervene. The foster parents were shocked and devastated, as was the therapist. Now the therapist was being asked to make recommendations for a transition plan from David to his biological father. So how can the fan be a part of this process for the therapist? Um, the fan holds a very explicit focus on that therapist's experience and use of self. In CPP, you're a conduit in a relationship. It's a unique concept. You are between, you are with people and you are between people. Reflective consultation offered to this therapist using the FAN framework helped her stay internally organized so she could be in touch and attuned with each person in the relationships they had to have. She had to grieve herself. Um, for the loss of this relationship. Um, this reflective consultation was needed over and over by the therapist as she worked through her initial shock and upset, the sadness for the foster parent, the anger at the father, and the deep worry for the child who finally had an attachment figure that was now going to be lost. Um, the distress and confusion needed to be addressed before this therapist could think clearly at all about what the plan could be or how she could be part of it. And the foster parents looked at the therapist to be their advocate. 
How will she hold that relationship when she needed to begin to develop one with the father and between the father and child? So reflective consultation using the fan again helped her work through her bias and begin to work through her preconceived ideas about what this family should look like. Much grieving, much support needed. Um, the reflect, fan reflective consultation helped her identify where each person was in their own processing so she could be present to them. And in the sessions, the actual intervention sessions when they were ready, um, it helped her be able to hold and realize she needed to hold and validate those feelings, how difficult the situation was, when they were more regulated, she began to think about the. She began to work with them to think about that child's internal world, and child's emotional state. She worked separately most of the time to build the capacity in each to go forward. The fan provided that emotional support to the CPP practitioner at those challenging moments in treatment. This father did work for over six months, and the transition was made. Um, and again, the work was at mu as much the internal work of the therapist as the internal work of the family. And that fan was a support to her and to those who supported the therapist um, as well. So the fan is also helpful in CPP learning collaboratives. Um, they all, uh, Jenny always starts her out with each person sharing what's it been like for you since our last session. So much for new clinicians needed to be, needs to be shared and they need to hear other people's experience. Um, that question, what was it like for you to be this, with this parent, can often be asked before the story is told of the case. And often even just in answering that question, you understand what the deepest issues are in the struggle for the therapist. Um, what, was it, uh, what was it like for this, you to be with this child? What was it like for you to work with this team member? What was it like to go to court? Um, where was this parent? Where was this other person? Where were you? Um, and what are you taking from this experience that will be helpful? All process that's really useful. Um, so the FAN is used now in training court teams and Patricia would love this. One of the judges said, uh, much like Marsha was saying, he said, if I didn't have the fan, I'd be standing up there yelling right back at him. You know, he said, the fan has helped me be a better judge. It's helped me be a better father. It's helped me be a better person. One of our judges has a laminated fan right on the bench. And he says, this helps me read the room. And I see if people are too upset. I know they can't think. Or I know after I give a recommendation, no one can hear another word. I know that now. I know when to give breaks to people. I know what to acknowledge. I know what it means to really hear a case, he said. Um, so judges say they clear their mind before a, a hearing. They slow down and they listen in order to gain perspective. And they use calming methods and feelings to explore the thoughts of others that may drastically differ from my own. That's the hard place to be. Um, and I think more about giving others time to speak, how powerful that would be. What do we know about child welfare workers trained in the FAN? It's an interesting finding that having this reflective consultation that I described around the case before, it reduces the link between having experienced vicarious trauma yourself and reporting burnout. In other words, I can hold these intense feelings with support and it doesn't deplete me in the same way. I can be with my reality with support. Um, so could the fan at all be a support for social justice? It's a small, it's a small tool, but can it help us in this much larger fight? You know, can us help it, can it help us here in this time in our country of racial strife? Can it let us turn to where the pain really is? Can it let us try to keep our emotional self in check as we listen without minimizing the trauma of racism that people have experienced? Can it allow us to name what is really true? 
and can it allow us to see what we're not trained to see, to see where the, the, where the bias lies within us? Can it allow us to begin the personal work around what it means to internal, have internalized racism from living in our US society? And can it allow us to listen from a place of compassion? For as Rhonda McGee says in her book on healing from racial trauma, we have all suffered enough. Um, I wanna just end with a few words on self-compassion. As compassion is needed in, for this work, compassion for ourselves and compassion for others, and Patricia knew this. Um, Self-compassion is really compassion directed inward. It's being touched by our own suffering and by generating a desire to alleviate our own suffering and treat ourselves with kindness and with concern. It's filling our cups up, as we would say. Um, it's the self-to-self -self relationship. Isn't that a powerful concept? One I don't think about nearly enough. How do we speak to ourself? How do we think about ourself? What words do we use? What tone of voice? How do we hold ourself? Self-compassion is a practice of goodwill, not of good feelings. In fact, self-compassion is used when you have bad feelings, when you feel you've let someone down, you've not done the right thing. That's when we need the goodwill. Kristen Neff has done the most research, I think, here in the US on this. She says there are three elements, self-kindness, can we be gentle and kind to ourselves rather than harsh and critical and judgmental? This is toward ourself. And can we recognize that we are part of the common humanity um, and feel connected to others when we feel so low, when we've not done, when we've not lived up to our values? Um, can we not feel isolated or alienated, but feel a part of the human, that this is part of the human condition for all of us? And can we use mindfulness to try and maintain a balance in those moments, not to ignore or defend ourselves or block it off and not to make it bigger than it is, but to truly be present. Buddhism has this concept of a second arrow. The first arrow comes from the outside the something I didn't do that I feel bad about, the, the objective reality. But that second arrow comes from within. How could I have done that? Now they see the real me. You know, those, those harsh, that harsh voice that we use to criticize ourselves. And what we know that harsh criticism of self activates our own threat system, that we are both the attacker and the attacked. But when we use self-compassion, to calm ourselves, we're both the soother and the soothed. When we have words that we can speak to ourselves, ways that we can reassure and encourage ourselves at those moments. Again, it's not about making nice, it's about acknowledging what really happened, being true to the loss, and then being able to live in community um, in, in a way that's uplifting for ourselves and others. So just take a moment to think of a moment of suffering and acknowledge that suffering is part of life and that you are not alone in that. And to think of a way that you might be kind to yourself, even in this moment. What might you say to yourself? How might you say it? And what can you let yourself feel that is encouraging and kind? And know that she is glowing with us. Thank you. Linda, thank you so much. Everybody is clapping their hands. <laughs> um, uh, I'm debating right now, um, uh, as I'm glowing with Patricia, um, about taking some questions or, or comments because we don't have a lot of time and I wanna make sure that we have time for um, yes. Cesar as well. I would um, say go ahead. I, I've loved, we've had a chance to talk and what you're going to hear will be invaluable. Um, are you staying on? I'll write. Oh, oh yes. Going to, yeah, yeah, okay. So we'll see oh, yeah. if we have some time toward the end, maybe oh, if yeah. you want to stay that they'll be able to also return to you. Oh, sure. Okay, um, yes. and comment and ask questions. Okay, and we'll do it that way. 
fantastic. And I will try to write you in the chat privately some of the things that some of the friends are going to say to us. 